So why uh, does is a small Swiss helicopter company being called to Nepal uh, to do rescues? Uh, this is basically the story of one man. His name is Thomas Humar. Uh, by this time, he was one of the best climbers in the world. He did uh, more than 700 first ascents, a lot of them in the Himalayas. And uh, most of the time he did it on his own, so he climbed uh, all by himself. And he was in 2003 in a, on a Pakistan um, expedition on a Nanga Parbat, and he did uh, also a first ascent, uh, the south face, and in the middle of the face he got stuck. Uh, it started to snow, uh, and he couldn't move uh, at all, so he couldn't descend back and he couldn't climb up anymore. So he had to dig uh, a snow hole, what we call it, uh, just to survive uh, until a rescue came. So the problem was the Pakistani, uh, they don't have uh, rescue companies like we know. So they asked uh, the army, the Pakistani army, to uh, get Thomas Hummer off that mountain. And they said, uh, no way, we cannot do it. Uh, we, we don't have the know-how, we don't have the equipment, there is just no way. And then it became a big issue. Uh, it went through all the embassies uh, and it came back to Switzerland. And they said, well, there is that little company. They have a lot of experience in mountain rescue. Why don't you ask them? Uh, so we were asked, to send a team to uh, Pakistan and so uh, to get him off that mountain. And by this time, the Pakistani, they heard something that the Swiss team is on the way to Islamabad and they put so much pressure on the pilots, the government, and they basically said, you have to get him off before the Swiss team arrives, otherwise uh, you can leave. So. Uh, a common rescue, like we know it, we use static ropes. Of course, they didn't have that equipment, so they just uh, got a common uh, climbing um, rope, which is dynamic, of course. They attached it to the helicopter, and they, they brought the rope to Thomas Hummer, and he attached himself uh, to that rope. So. The problem is now that the pilot didn't have an idea what's going on uh, at the bottom and he just started to pull uh, and yeah. all of a sudden Thomas Hummer was released and yeah. he was just shot yeah. up. Uh, he was, you can see it, uh, the quality is not so good but he was basically, it was like a bungee but just uh, on the other way and uh, he was flipping up uh, in, into the helicopter. So. It uh, basically, they were very lucky that Thomas Hummer hit the helicopter because otherwise he would have gone through the blades and everyone would have been dead. So up to this time, Thomas Hummer was not injured at all. <laughs> uh, this is how he looked uh, after the rescue. So he was very heavily injured. He had a um, skull trauma and he had to be hospitalized for quite some time. And a few years later, it was the same story again with Thomas Humar, but this time he was in Nepal. Um, <laughs> so he sent again a call, and uh, the situation was just the same. The Nepali uh, companies, they said, we cannot do it. So it, it came again back to Erzermat. Uh, we sent the team uh, to Kathmandu, and the uh, Nepali pilots were keen to learn it. Uh, they invited us, okay, sh show us how to do it. Uh, the team found Thomas Humar quite quickly, but uh, actually he was dead already. So he just uh, fall, fell down a few meters and uh, probably broke his back and he died on the mountain. And we had to say, okay, uh, there is no way we cannot rescue people in the Himalayas out of Switzerland because you're too late all the time. So <coughs> we tried to form teams. Uh, part uh, one was a, uh, consisting of one pilot and one mountain guide hanging down on the rope uh, like we do it here in Switzerland. Uh, so I 
was lucky to be the first to go down there together with Richard, the mountain guide. And the first problem we had, uh, we, I didn't, uh, they didn't accept my Swiss helicopter license, so I had to do the license again. <laughs> So I had to go to school for one week with this gentleman. <laughs> and uh, after that, I had to take a test, 60 questions or whatever. And then he said to me, well, I'm sure you will pass the test. But for $50, you can be very sure that you pass it. <laughs> so uh, already at the, you know, when I was in that ground course, uh, there were was the first rescue going on at uh, Manaslu, that's one of the 8,000 meter peaks in Nepal. Uh, mostly we didn't know, uh, you know what happened. We just knew which mountain it is and what country is involved. And it was a Korean expedition. Uh, two were missing and two were uh, stuck at Camp 2 and uh, they couldn't move anymore. This is uh, Sabin Bosniat. He was by then the chief pilot of uh, the company, its name is Fishtail Air, which was the local uh, helicopter company. And uh, immediately, you know, if you met these people, it was a, you know, a really strong connection because, you know, maybe some of you have been in Nepal, the people are extremely, you know, uh, I don't know the word, it's not friendly, they just, I think you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I hardly knew him by this time, and we came to the Manaslu, and first we had to look where are these people, where are the camps, because of course we didn't know where the locations were. Uh, we were flying up the mountain and uh, noticed the camp too, it was about six and a half thousand meters already, and we flew down, and Sabin, uh, the chief pilot, uh, you've seen before, he asked me, well, do you want to fly the rescue? And, and I said, yeah, <laughs> well, if you don't go, I, I, I would love to fly. Just imagine the other way. Uh, I'm in Zermatt at the helicopter base. There is a Nepali guy coming to me, and I tell them, just take the helicopter and see what, what you can do. So that's a different way of thinking. Uh, uh, Camp 2, uh, you can see it at the picture. Um, the, peep, the Sherpas, they already prepared the landing spot, so we didn't have to attach a rope on the helicopter. And we could, uh, uh, Richard went out and he went into the tents so that the people couldn't move anymore. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, you know, you can almost watch them die. And as soon as you bring them down to the base camp, which is usually about 4,000 meters, you can see them really coming back alive. So it's uh, very impressive. Uh, the two missing Korean, we couldn't find them. Uh, we actually found them the next year. Uh, and this gentleman here, he was the expedition leader of that Korean expedition. And he radioed up to Richard and he told him, uh, just load the Koreans. You don't, you don't load the, the Sherpas. They can go back uh, by foot. And uh, Richard was very smart and he radioed back, well, they all look the same. I don't know who's Korean <laughs> and who's it. <laughs> we just, uh, after that, we went back to the mountain because we couldn't find these two missing. Uh, we took a lot of pictures. You cannot imagine how many people are lying uh, around in the Himalayas. So we uh, took as many pictures as we could. Uh, we showed them the pictures. He went through them and he said, no, not mine. That's, I don't know him. So that's, that's how it goes there. Uh, just a few days later, we had a rescue on the Annapurna. Annapurna is a very special mountain. It's uh, also an 8,000 meter mountain, but it's uh, the most difficult one. So I'm not very sure about the numbers, but I think Everest has something like 5,000 climbs already. Uh, Annapurna has about 200. And out of these 200 are 60 people dying. So you can almost say every third uh, um, 
that reaches the peak will will uh, get one dead <laughs> body back. So this was a Spanish expedition. Uh, as as usual, we didn't know a lot what what went on. Uh, we just heard that one was at Camp Four. Uh, two, sorry, two people at Camp Four, and one was somewhere be, uh, be between Camp Four and the peak, and he couldn't move his legs anymore, and be became blind, probably snow blind. So we flew to the base camp. You can see it on the picture. The winds were really strong, so we tried to get up to that camp, but it was so strong that you know the helicopter was just literally bouncing uh, around, so we couldn't think of a rescue at this time. So we went back to the base camp. Uh, you can see that this is about the location of camp uh, four, around 7,000 meters. So we had to go back and uh, think of alternatives. So, uh, how can we get these people down? So uh, our plan, what we decided was to take a Sherpa with uh, oxygen and just fly him as high as we can. You know, maybe it will be 5,000 meters, maybe six, whatever. So the problem, of course, is you will lose another day. Okay? Until he is up to that camp four, it takes at least another day. So after a while, we noticed that the wind is getting a bit weaker. So that's where we started. Uh, you can see Richard uh, hanging on the rope here. It's about a 30-meter rope you see here. Um, it's quite impressive, you know, if you see him hanging uh, on the rope. Uh, we don't have that in the Alps here. In the Himalayas, you know, you move like 50 feet away from the, from the mountain and you will have 3,000 meters of air below you. <laughs> and I always told Richard, I'm glad that you hang on the rope and it's not me. <laughs> So what is the difficulty? Jack mentioned it. Imagine a car, you know, you have a, a RPM indication on your car and uh, it goes up to 10. You have a red arc and as soon as you're in the red arc, you will break the motor. It's the same principle here. Uh, there is a little tiny red uh, section you see. You can use that for five seconds. And of course, in this altitude, you have to use it. Um, the turbine has about 7% of the performance it has uh, on uh, sea level. So there is really not much left. Uh, we tried it three times to approach the site and after the third time we could manage to, to uh, fly the people down from camp for, you can see uh, Richard hanging down here. Of course, we had to train the Nepali pilots because the goal is that they can do the rescues on their own. And the following summer, they came back to uh, Switzerland and we did the whole training with them like we do it in Switzerland, our own pilots and mountain guides. And they could go in on real-time rescue missions. Some of them put them under incredible psychological stress, like you can see it on this picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <coughs> they did uh, the whole training, uh, like we know it. And after that, in uh, autumn, the, na the same year, uh, Sabin and Purna, the two uh, people we worked most of the time with, they had a rescue mission on Ahmad Ablam. At this time, nobody of, from us, from our company, was on site. Uh, and they tried to rescue a German and a Japanese guy from Ahmad Ablan. This is actually the last picture you see. And uh, they hit uh, the mountain. Uh, you will see it on this movie here, uh, what happened. You see the helicopter approaching the rescue site. And of course, this accident was not uh, survivable, so it was a huge step back. Uh, I, I don't even want, uh, you know, I don't... <coughs> uh, it's very emotional still after uh, this many years. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>